Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anja Paciniak. I'd like to welcome you all here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome Dr. Steven Taylor and uh, Mr. Ka Karol Fiokowski, our uh, main speakers today. Uh, welcome all the, of you who are gathered here today. And for the debate uh, that will try to answer the question whether the Christianity is based by evidence. Uh, Dr. Taylor, Mr. Fiaukowski, thank you for letting us benefit from your knowledge today. Uh, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of those who organized uh, today's meeting. And this is Projekt Kościół, a Christian Apologetic Institute, uh, Pantheon Foundation, and our first Baptist church here at Kłodnicka. Uh, and on behalf of uh, the pastor, also known as uh, my husband. Uh, our church, uh, we want to be a, the church that consists of people who love God and his word at the first place and uh, love and respect others and are open-minded and interested in the world around us. And if you want to dig into the subject more, I would like to invite you for our next meetings tomorrow and on Friday uh, that will took the place also here at 6 p.m. And so now, um, Let's welcome Mr. Rafał Pańczuk, who will moderate the debate and tell you uh, more. Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. I will tell you something about the more technical aspects of the debate. But first of all, uh, I start with the available materials at the back there you can see there are some books, some DVDs so they will be available after the debate the second thing this debate is broadcasted you can set your radios or mobile phones at the frequency 88.5 megahertz and now coming to the very debate so each of our guests has initially for opening statements 25 minutes and starting the opening statements, each of our guests, our debaters, will tell something about himself. Then, after this part of the debate, we will have each 15 minutes a rebuttals session. And after that, we will have the cross-examination session. It means 15 minutes and each of you can ask questions to the the other guest. And then we can have open questions for the audience. And finally, there will be a closing statement at the end of the debate. So I think we can start. Starting from Steve Taylor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being here uh, today. Uh, a little bit about myself, um, I currently serve as a professor in the University of Liverpool in the Faculty of Science and Engineering in the School of Electrical Engineering, Electronics and Computer Science. My specialist interest is in uh, mass spectrometry and in particular we're working on a number of projects, one of which is the application of mass spectrometers in um, archaeology. So my subject which was suggested by Mr. Fjolkowski is, is Christianity evidence-based? Is Christianity evidence-based? This was a very important question and I'm very happy to attempt to speak to that uh, if I may. So is Christianity evidence-based? What I'd like to do is talk, look at what is Christianity? and look at the basis for the question. Secondly, to define the terms. What do we mean by evidence? What do we mean by proof? What do we mean by testimony? Uh, thirdly, to look at 
direct or eyewitness evidence, which in a British court is the highest form of evidence. And then, of course, indirect evidence or corroborating evidence, and I'm going to look at evidence outside of the Bible for the thesis that Christianity is evidence-based. Uh, I'm going to look at the evidence in particular for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And finally, uh, circumstantial evidence for the same event. Uh, reaching a verdict, every jury in a court has to reach a verdict and tonight I would like you to act as a jury and to listen to the presentation of the evidence. I would like to challenge you to reach a verdict. I would like to challenge you to reach the verdict that Christianity is true. And so that is my aim in speaking tonight. And also, it's important when we look at um, evidence, uh, we're looking at historical evidence as opposed to mainly historical evidence, uh, evidence that will be presented in a court. It's important to consider what other lawyers have said about the evidence for the resurrection. We're talking of a matter of history, something that happened as a one-off event in the past, not something that's repeatable as we would normally consider for a scientific experiment. And so we're going to look at what lawyers have said and what historians have said, and then finally make some questions. So the basis for Christianity, I've chosen a letter, a letter from the Apostle Paul, a letter to a church, I suppose something like this church, only this church was 2,000 years ago. This was a letter written uh, AD 54, 55. And it reads like this. For I delivered to you, uh, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, and then by the twelve, after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep, i.e. they've died. After that, he was seen by James and then by the apostles. Then he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. That is a very important passage written very early, less than or 20, 25 years after Jesus had lived and died, written to a church of believers in a, not the same country, in another country because the church had spread to Greece by this time, and written as a man, as an apostle to his friends. He claims multiple witnesses and also to be one of those witnesses to the resurrection. So this is the basis for Christianity. I'll sum it up. The life of Christ. Christianity is all about Christ. You notice in the passage, Christ is mentioned again and again. It's about his life and his teachings. It's about his death and it's about his burial. It's about the bodily resurrection of Christ from the grave after three days. That is the tremendous claim of the Christian gospel, that a dead man rose again three days after he was crucified. All of this was predicted hundreds of years previously in the Old Testament scriptures, which are, of course, in the hands of the Jewish people, could not be tampered with by Christians. And, of course, the appearances of the risen Christ over a period of 40 days to multiple eyewitnesses in different scenarios, some of whom touched him, others of whom ate their dinner with him, ate their breakfast with him. This is the basis of the claim. And of course, the subsequent conversion of his disciples, all, all of whom were unbelieving at the start, some of whom were doubters and did not believe, but then were convinced by an appearance to them of Christ, and some of them were persecutors, enemies of Christ, and they became followers. That is the basis for Christianity. Let's define terms. Evidence, then, is the available body of facts or, uh, or in, information, including whether a belief is 
true or valid. Okay, that's a definition from the Oxford English Dictionary. Proof, evidence sufficient to examine a thing, to establish a thing as true and to produce belief as truth. You could think of proof as the accumulation of evidence. And of course, testimony is a formal or written statement, especially given uh, in a court of law. So what we have in the basis we're just seeing is a testimony there based upon the letter of Paul. It's his evidence. And of course, we don't only have the evidence of, we don't only have the evidence of Paul, we have the evidence of the Gospels. Not one, not two, not three, but four. And I'm going to read out um, there, you can see these are evidence. Let me just bring mine up on the screen. Um, so here we are, the evidence of the Gospels. So then, Matthew wrote the sayings in the Hebrew language and interpreted them as he was able. That was written by Papias, who was a disciple of John, the apostle. He's said to have lived around AD 130, but it could have been earlier. So this is uh, 50 to 75 years after the event. Um, and he attributes Matthew to have written the first gospel. This is backed up by Irenaeus of Leon. Matthew put forth a gospel right among the Hebrews in their own speech while Peter and Paul were preaching the gospel in Rome and founding the church there. So if we take those two witnesses, um, then we f find that Matthew's gospel was written before 65 AD. Then we come to Mark's gospel. Now Mark was an interpreter for Peter. Peter the fisherman, Peter the, uh, one of the leading disciples of Christ who saw everything from the very beginning. Mark was his interpreter. And uh, Irenaeus says this, after there, that's Peter and Paul's departure, he means death, Mark, Peter's disciple and interpreter, likewise delivered to us the substance of Peter's preaching. Another witness, Eusebius, it is related that in his or Nero's time, Paul was beheaded in Rome itself and that Peter was likewise crucified. And so the title of Peter and Paul, which is still given to the cemeteries there, confirms the story. So Mark is written after AD 65, AD 67, that's a time period for Mark. Uh, Luke, then uh, Luke, the companion of Paul, set down in a book the, the gospel proclaimed by that apostle. Look how careful Luke is to uh, suggest that he has eyewitnesses. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled amongst us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the beginning eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Sorry, let me bring that up. There we are. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good to me to write an orderly account for you most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of those things that you have been taught. Eyewitness account. Eyewitness account. And now Luke, eyewitness account from multiple sources. Writing before 62 AD. We can establish that from his second book in the Bible, which is Acts. And the fourth gospel claims to be an eyewitness himself. So here we have John. Uh, John, then John, who, the disciple who reclined on Jesus' bosom, in turn published his gospel while he was staying at Ephesus in Asia. So it's after Matthew, Mark and Luke, but before AD 70, which was the destruction of Jerusalem. You can establish that from the evidence internal in the gospel. He says these words, This is the disciple who testified these things and wrote them down, and we know that his testimony is true. So John is claiming to be an eyewitness of the life, of the miracles, of the death, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and to have written these things down in the book that we call the Gospel of John. A summary, eyewitness evidence, direct evidence, the highest form of evidence that we can have, we have it multiple times in the Gospels of the life, the teachings of Christ. Peter, Peter put it like this, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And just imagine, ladies and gentlemen, if you had been one of those disciples, would you not want to write down the things that you had seen 
and heard, and even if it was on pain of death, as it was for nearly all of the disciples. This is so important. A man has conquered death that you would want other people to hear about this. This is the basis of Christianity, and this is how it was born. The summary then, the picture, from AD 33 or thereabouts, the death and resurrection of Jesus the Messiah, the four Gospels are written until AD 70 when the Roman armies came upon Jerusalem and destroyed it. But the evidence is, uh, is strong as well. If we consider, sorry, corroborating evidence outside of the Bible, let me just see if I can bring that up to you. Yeah. So here we have the Rylands Papyrus uh, P52 which is dated from about 125 AD. Sorry, you can't quite see the screen there. It's a section of the Gospel of John. Um, it's less than 50 years after the Gospel of John was written, or thereabouts, 50 years or thereabouts, and it's already found, this is found in Egypt. So already we have copies of the Gospel going round the ancient world, less uh, 125, 150, dated by the handwriting, and it matches exactly the gospel that you find in Polish or in English. These are the words that you find on that scrap. I've seen that scrap of paper myself. It's in the John Rylands Museum in Manchester in England. It establishes a very early date for the gospels. <clears throat> Let's come to corroborating evidence outside of the Bible. So these are not written by Christians. Josephus is a Jewish historian. Corroborating evidence supports other testimony. It affirms the essential elements of an eyewitness account. He said these things. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who wrought surprising feats amongst us and was a teacher. When Pilate condemned him to be crucified, those who had in the first place come to love him did not give up their affection for him. On the third day he appeared to them restored to life. For the prophets of God have prophesied these things and countless other marvellous things about him. Did you notice how many things Josephus in his evidence there confirms what Paul had written in the letter to the Corinthians? He's a non-Christian, he's a Jewish and he's a historian of the first importance in the first century. Another one of course is a Roman historian writing at the start of the second century, Christus from whom the name had its origin had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. So here is then biblical evidence being confirmed by non-biblical writers, corroborating evidence as well as direct. Old Testament evidence. Here's a part of the Dead Sea Scroll. It's written about 100 years before uh, the Christian era, about 100 BC. You can go and see it, of course, in Jerusalem. And it's a prophecy. And they made his grave with the wicked. But with the rich in his death. Jesus was crucified with thieves, but buried in a rich man's tomb who donated it. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him and put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, Jesus died for sin. Sinners, according to Peter and Paul. He shall, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days. He's going to die, but he's going to live. And the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He shall see the labour of his soul, and he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Christ dying for sinners is the testimony of Isaiah. Note the date, 700 BC, this piece of evidence uh, from a copy of the original at 100 BC. And then we come on to another piece of interesting evidence. Here's a heel bone. It's pierced by a large nail from a victim of crucifixion, Roman crucifixion, first century, found in Jerusalem in 1968. It proves that the Romans did nail their victims to crosses. And of course, a thousand years previously, David had said these words. They pierced my hands and my feet. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. For thy clothing they cast lots. A thousand years previously to the crucifixion, David prophesied these things. He was never pierced hands and feet. Christ, his son, his ancestor, was, of course. 
So there's corroborating evidence from externally and there's evidence which is written before the Bible which also confirms it. Let's look at the direct evidence for the resurrection. In the first passage that we read, um, there's a number of times we find three words. He was seen. So Christ died, was buried, raised. He was seen by Peter, then by 12. He was seen by over 500 people at once, men, most of whom were still alive when this was being written. He was seen by James, who was an unbeliever, but was converted. He was seen by all the apostles. He was seen by me, says Paul, as he writes. He is a direct, personal witness to the resurrection. Is Christianity evidence-based? I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, that it, that it is. This is powerful evidence. This is the evidence of eyewitnesses. Seen on multiple occasions, 12 actually, by over 520 witnesses over a period of 40 days. Firstly, by Mary Magdalene, seen by women firstly on Easter Sunday morning, then later in the afternoon, then the 10 apostles in the evening, then the apostles and Thomas, then 500, then seven apostles, then the apostle Paul years later. This is the evidence of direct evidence, okay? Multiple eyewitnesses. Now, we come on to the circumstantial evidence for the resurrection. Uh, to give a definition, uh, circumstantial evidence is evidence, indirect facts, from which inferences can be drawn. Indirect facts, okay? So, um, for instance, if you find there's someone being accused of murder and they have the blood, the dagger, the blood's on their clothes, uh, they had a motive, etc., etc., you may not have direct evidence, but you have a powerful case against them by indirect evidence. Shall we look at the indirect evidence, the circumstantial evidence for the resurrection? Um, the disciples were willing to suffer hardship, ridicule, torture, and to die for their beliefs, for no financial gain. Now, people die for their religious beliefs if they sincerely believe they are true. But men and women won't die for their religious beliefs if they know that their beliefs are false. A Muslim terrorist will blow himself up he believes it to be true, he's false, but he wouldn't do that if he didn't believe that he would get to heaven, etc., etc. If he knew it was a lie, he wouldn't do that. The apostles, they knew it was true, so they did it. They wouldn't have died had they known that the resurrection was a lie. Think about it. Uh, Lee Strobel, who wrote this, was once an atheist. And he was convinced by looking at the evidence for the resurrection. For any who may call themselves atheists here, I'm glad that you're here. I urge you to consider the evidence for the resurrection. Hardened skeptics down through the centuries have been converted. The church has emerged. It was an illegal religion for the first 200 years. And of course, in spite of persecution, has dominated uh, the planet. There is now more Christians and churches, more Christians than there ever has been, and of course on every country and in every language there are Christians. And of course there's ongoing encounters with Christ today. Um, let me give you uh, millions, in fact, from all over the world, in every culture, from all backgrounds, men and women, rich and poor, uneducated and educated, have come to the conclusion Christ rose. Let's look at what the lawyers say, okay? Is Christianity evidence-based? John Copley, uh, John Singleton Copley was a law lord called Lord Lindhurst in uh, the UK. That's the highest legal office in the UK. He was Lord High Chancellor of Britain three times. That's an office that's higher than the Prime Minister, okay? He said this, I know pretty well what evidence is. And I tell you, such evidence as that for the resurrection has never broken down yet. Is Christianity evidence-based? He believes so. Another lawyer said this, As a lawyer, I've made a prolonged study of the evidence for the events of the first Easter day. To me, the evidence is overwhelming, conclusive. 
And over and over again in the High Court, I've secured the verdict on evidence not nearly so compelling. Lawyers believe the evidence is there and it's overwhelming. Is, what about historians? I claim to be a historian and I say that the evidence for the resurrection of Christ is better authenticated than most of the facts of ancient history. Professor Blakelock, Professor of Classics. I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is better proved, which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort than the resurrection. And that was Thomas Arnold, Regius Professor of Modern History at Oxford University in the 19th century. The lawyers believe there's evidence and it's overwhelming, and the historians believe there's evidence and it's overwhelming. So is Christianity evidence-based? Christianity is based upon the life, death, and bodily resurrection of its founder, Jesus Christ. There exists direct evidence of multiple eyewitnesses. There exists corroborating evidence of contemporary writers who are not Christians. There exists predictive evidence of, old, of the Old Testament scriptures, which were written hundreds of years before. There exists circumstantial evidence of the martyrdom of the disciples, the existence of the church, and conversion of skeptics. There exists a multitude of evidence which has been found to be overwhelming by leading lawyers and historians, as well as millions of ordinary people throughout history. Ladies and gentlemen, is Christianity evidence-based? Yes, it is. What is your verdict on this evidence? Thank you. So, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. It's a great privilege, it's a great honor, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to debate Professor Taylor. It's a great privilege to debate him. Uh, I used to be a Christian. I was a Christian for 13 or, s or so years. And just before I finished being a Christian, I made a, short, a very short list of churches that I um, I intended to check out whether or not I will go there to attend this church regularly on a regular basis. And the first Baptist church, this very church, was on this very short list. Had I managed to, to get there, to get here before I deconverted, maybe I would still be a, be a believer today, only God knows. Uh, today, uh, here I am, a nihilist on the pulpit of this church. So let me, let me use this opportunity to express my deep respect for the hosts of this venue to let this uh, event occur here. Uh, I'm an economist by training. I've worked on the Wrocław University of Economics for eight years. Um, I lectured in economics and, uh, and ethics. Uh, right now, I am co-founder and uh, chairman of the Pantheon Foundation. Uh, we uh, engage in debates, we engage in interviews, we engage in analyzing and, and um, trying to find out what religions are really about and what arguments and what proofs and what evidence they really have at their disposal. Please check out Fundacja Pantheon on YouTube and on Facebook. And I am also uh, as, uh, an, um, uh, an assistant of uh, a call-in show, Stacja Ateism, the Atheism Station. Please check in also Stacja Ateism on YouTube and on the, on the internet. Is Christianity evidence-based? Uh, I would like to set one thing straight first from the beginning, and this is the issue of the burden of proof. The burden of proof in, in, a, in a popular 
uh, formulation, which is enough for, t for, t for tonight. The burden of proof is the issue. Which side of the argument must provide sufficient amount of, and quality of reasons and evidence in order, to, in order for an objective, unbiased third party to decide the issue? And the rule is that the burden of proof always lies on the side which makes a positive claim. And there are, there are good reasons for it. Uh, first of all, when you are in introduced to something new or something unknown, it would be strange of me or of you to formulate some kind of arguments. It is, of course, on the side which makes the claim to explain and to argue and to give evidence for it. Secondly, it's illogically impossible to believe everything because different claims are mutually exclusive. So whenever somebody makes a positive claim, the default position is to uh, wait in a, in a sort of neutral state and wait until the issue is settled. It is practically impossible to believe everything. You cannot, you cannot follow every possible claim. It's physically impossible. Therefore, the default position is to wait, uh, stay neutral until the claimant with, with the positive case makes his case. And last and not least, there is a matter, it's a matter of prudence because not everything people say in life is true. You may not have noticed that. And the, it, it may occur for different reasons. People may be deceived. People may want to deceive you. It happens, sadly. So it's a matter of prudence that you don't jump into uh, somebody's, somebody's claims just like that, but you wait until the claimant of the positive claim makes his case. Therefore, my job to, uh, uh, tonight would be simply to refute, I would be simply to uh, refute what Professor Taylor is saying, and I'm going to be doing that, of course, but I, uh, I would like to do something more. I would like to provide you with some reasons why I think it's a huge and misleading overstatement that Christianity is evidence-based, and I would like to argue for this case positively also. How do, you, how do you recognize an academic when you first see him? He begins whatever he's talking about by definitions. So let me just, let me just uh, tell you about my definitions of evidence. And usually, it, usually it's, from, it's, it's usually from a dictionary. Although I would like to propose a more rigid, a more stringent kind of definition of the evidence in, uh, in comparison with this popular soft definition of evidence, which is uh, similar to what Professor Taylor has just said, that evidence is one or more reason for believing something is true, uh, or uh, an outward sign, an indication of something. I would like to propose to you um, um, the definition of evidence, which is more in line with the academic background of all of us. So what is evidence considered in science? Uh, in order to understand that, let me just say a couple of words of, about the scientific method, how it works as a procedure. Um, the sci in doing science, in doing, doing science, you first formulate hypotheses about patterns of observable phenomena. Then you test the hypothesis by collecting and analyzing empirical data. Uh, then you refine the hypothesis, you do further testing, further research, and so on ad infinitum. Now, because of this, I would like to define evidence as follows, that this, in science generally, evidence is observable phenomena that reliably and unambiguously points to the truth of a particular hypothesis. What makes good evidence is that it is reliable and unambiguous. What makes what makes bad evidence is that something is first unreliable. So it cannot be accepted as real or cannot be accepted as relevant data for the issue. And secondly, it is ambiguous. So it allows alternative explanations for, for, for the phenomena, for the data. Now, I would like to present to you examples of, of this uh, from the uh, field of uh, evolutionary versus uh, creation science. So, um, let me let me let me uh, let me give you some examples for what creation scientists don't recognize as evidence when it comes to uh, the theory of evolution. So, uh, by uh, evolutionary scientists comes and says we have radioactive dating. Creation scientists uh, comes and says radioactive dating uh, gives unstable, conflicting results. Uh, and worst of all, it's dependent on the assumptions made by the researcher himself. Therefore, it's unreliable. It cannot be taken as evidence. Uh, the evolutionist says we have Darwin's finches, and Darwin's finches are the, the, the phenomenon that gave rise to the idea of the tree of life, the common uh, descent of posterior generations from a common ancestor. Um, 
But the, um, the, uh, the creationists may come and say, this proves only variation within a kind. It does not prove variation be, uh, that one kind can morph into some, something else. It does not prove speciation. So it's not evidence for evolution. Then um, uh, uh, an evolutionary scientist can come and say, well, we have fossils and we have the Grand Canyon. This proves that there have been long time intensive processes operating. And so this is a proof that the Earth is millions of years uh, uh, old and so on. But the creation scientist comes, look at, looks at the same data and says, this came on uh, as a result of huge forces operating in a very short time, so it may be evidence for a flood, not millions of years of evolution or, or geological, uh, geological evolution. Uh, and lastly, uh, the, uh, the biologist, the evolutionary biologists uh, may, may claim there are homologous structures, there is DNA in all life forms, therefore this is evidence of common ancestry from a, from a common ancestor of all life forms. But the creationist comes and says, no, this may be evidence of a common designer which operates, which uses a common blueprint. Why did I give this particular field of examples? Because I I, I think it's more likely that Professor Taylor would agree to my definition of evidence because we operate in more or less the same, in more or less the same um, uh, way of thinking about it. What is Christianity? Uh, I defined Christianity on these three basic uh, premises. So there is a God who created everything. The Bible is inspired by God and true. And Jesus of Nazareth is the, the divine sign, uh, uh, son, uh, son of God. Let's find out whether or not you can, we can say that Christianity is evidence-based. Is there evidence for God first? Now, the normal uh, evidence that is given for God is the evidence for design, uh, which comes from in the forms of irreducible complexity of life and the fine-tuning of cosmological constants. Now, the first thing to say about this is that the, normally what the, creation, what the creationist does is that he says, look, in life there is so much co irreducible complexity, look, the universe is so finely tuned, and then he starts asking questions. Uh, where did it all come from? Where did the laws of physics come from? Why is the universe fine-tuned? How did life originate? How is it possible that life is irreducibly complex? And so on and so on. And this is what he counts as evidence for a god. Now I put it to you that questions is not evidence. Questions is evidence only that we don't know something. And probably we don't know something yet. So, um, to put, God is certainly a possible answer to these questions, but he is posited, he is inserted, he is invoked as an answer without any warrant and evidence. There are alternative explanations to the hypothesis that, that God created everything. First of all, there, it, is, it is real that science has not got answers to these questions yet. Um, science is an ongoing process, it continues to, to, to be, it continues to search for answers for these questions also. In his public um, presentation, Science and Christianity, Friends of Foes, Professor Taylor says, science is always changing. There is no certainties in science. The Big Bang Theory is the prevailing paradigm in today's cosmology. Of course it will change in 50 years from now. So Professor Taylor understands very well that science may one day, in the future, provide answers to these questions. So, Positing God today is premature, is fallacious. And uh, there are also alternative designers. Of course, there is a long way from saying that something is irreducibly complex to say that the Jehovah of hosts exists and Jesus is his son. There might be alternative designers. Of course, if there is irreducibly complex life and fine-tuned universe, it might have been done by Allah, the God of the Quran. Why not? What evidence do you have that it wasn't? But it gets even more interesting because we, uh, we have alternative explanations for a design without a personal God. Possibility, possibility number one, it may be physical necessity. Uh, complexity, like, uh, like for example a mind, can be a necessary emergent proper, uh, property of life. There might be a polytheistic solution, gods or demons, intelligent enough to produce life, but not necessarily all-powerful, all-knowing and immortal, nothing that Professor Taylor would call God. Maybe there is a pantheistic God that Spinoza wrote about, who expresses himself in the nature as a physical nature. Maybe uh, there is the impersonal logos that Heraclitus and the Stoics wrote about, the 
impersonal pervasive ra rationality that expresses itself in the rationality of the laws of the cosmos. Maybe there is the, the Buddhists are right, and there is this all-encompassing impersonal mind, the radiant awareness that expresses itself playfully in the material world, for example, by producing life in, in, in all, of its, all of its complexities. Now, my question to Professor Taylor in its due time would be, design granted, how exactly do you come from uh, design and complexity to particularly the Christian God. What makes you so confident that it's exactly the Christian God that is responsible for, for all of this? Um, is there evidence for the Bible? Now, the evidence given for the truth of the Bible is usually as follows. The Bible is claims to be the word of God. The Bible is uniquely coherent. Um, the Bible is scientifically reliable. The Bible is historically re reliable and it includes fulfilled predictive prophecies. Let's deal with the first two quickly. The Bible claims to be the word of God. My humble and very much academic question would be, so what? Many books claim to be the word of God. The Quran claims to be the word of God, even more so and even more directly. The Quran says, this is the word of God. This is me, God speaking. I have given you the Quran. This is my word. So it's even stronger is um, a word of God than the Bible, on, on, basing on, on, this, uh, on this assumption. And claims is not evidence for anything but somebody claims something. Now, um, the Bible is said to be uniquely coherent, which is not a miracle at all, because the subsequent writers knew very well the previous writings. So if that produces over hundreds and thousands of, time, of, of years of time, produces a coherent book, that's hardly a surprise. And some churches boast that they have the, the Bible, some churches use this argument that the, the Bible is so reliable because it has, be, it, had, it has undergone the process of canonization. So the books were deliberately collected and selected to be coherent. There is no God was necessary to collect a coherent book like the Bible. Now let's get to uh, the, most, the more messy stuff. Uh, the Bible is not scientifically reliable. There is light Hello? There is light without any source of light, according to the Bible. The earth is a flat circle. The earth has pillars and foundations. Above the earth there is a hard firmament where the sun and moon and stars are situated. Bats are birds, according to the Bible. In the Bible there are talking animals, at least one snake and at least one donkey. At according to the Bible, you can breed animals with particular patterns of marks and spots on them by making them look at the like cut shapes of wood while they are mating. According to the Bible, you can cleanse a house contamination by sprinkling the walls of the house with the bird's blood. You can examine whether or not your wife was faithful to you or not by making her drink water with the dust from the floor of the temple. We could go on and on, but you get the idea. These people don't have a clue about modern science. The Bible is not historically reliable. There is no independent attestation for all of the following. Humanity originating from Noah's family, the Tower of Babel, the existence of Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, King David himself, the presence of Israelites in Egypt, the plagues of Egypt, the Exodus, the glorious conquest of Canaan, the glorious empire of David and Solomon, the slaughter of the innocents by King Herod, the miracles of Jesus involving thousands of people, darkness upon the earth at the moment of Jesus' death, many dead people coming back to life and visiting Jerusalem. Don't you think that those vast, massive historical events would be noticed by some one body other than the authors of the Bible? But it gets worse because there are some claims of the Bible that contradict what we now know about history. Uh, Nineveh was never converted by the prophet Jonah to the Jewish God, and so it was not saved. It was, it was never converted, and it was destroyed. The Roman census, where everyone was obliged to travel to their place of origin, is a, is a complete nonsense from the administrative point of view. Uh, no, n there is no evidence that there will be any need for any such thing, but there is plenty of evidence that is organizationally burdensome. A staged, triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem as a Messiah without immediately being arrested by the Romans. It's completely uh, uh, out of the question. It's completely unreliable that the entry of Jesus that was deliberately staged according to the Old Testament prophecies to, to send the message that this is the Messiah and the people reacting to it, welcome King, uh, welcome son of, uh, King, son of David, that the Romans would not react. 
the pilot's custom of releasing one prisoner over Passover is not only not attested anywhere, but it's contrary to whatever we know about Pilate from other sources. Sanhedrin meeting during Passover night is completely out of the question. And I singled it out because I, I suspected what was coming. Uh, deposing corpses down from the crosses immediately after death is contrary to what we know about uh, crucifixion. I think I'm going to spend more time about uh, the supposed evidence for resurrection in my rebuttal period. Uh, the Bible prophecies come in three categories. There are, first, there are failed Bible prophecies. Uh, the Bible prophes prophesizes that King Nebuchadnezzar will destroy Tyre. Alexander the Great destroyed Tyre. It prophesizes that Egypt and Assyria will convert to the Lord and nothing of this sort ever happened. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah prophesied that the Babylonian captivity of the Jews will last for 70 years. It lasted for 48 years. So whenever you, the Bible attempts at being precise at prophecy, it fails. So the authors apparently learned the lesson and they became more ambiguous so that to make it harder for anyone to pinpoint their mistakes. So if you take the book of Daniel or if you take the book of Revelation and if you read or see or speak with anybody concerned with Christian eschatology, so the theology of the end times, and they will tell you what the, inter the proper interpretation of these books is, then you will learn that there are at least uh, five, six, ten, whoever knows, conflicting uh, proper interpretations of these books. And each of the group claims that their interpretation is proper. Why? Because these books are written in this way. They are full of symbolism, they are, they are full of ambiguities. So you can have uh, all kinds of interpretations va uh, ranging from it already happened in the past uh, through it happens right now to it is happening in the future. And the, the third kind of prophecy in the Bible is the recognized or written after the events prophecy in the Bible. So the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament fulfilled in Jesus are obviously recognized as such by the authors of the New Testament. So it's not a miracle that they, the people who wrote the accounts of Jesus knew the Old Testament prophecies. Now, how, uh, how far-fetched is it a stretch of, of imagination to imagine that they specifically wrote the biography of Jesus to match the prophecies and not the other way around. And the destruction of Jerusalem by the, Rome, uh, by the Romans in the year uh, 70 is prophesied in the gospel. Actually, the dates that Professor Taylor gave you, that the gospels were written before the year 70, is a minority opinion. The majority of scholars date, at best, they date uh, the Gospel of Mark uh, before 70, the, the other gospels after the year 70. Is there evidence that Jesus is God? Uh, what is given? Miracles, uh, his superior knowledge, his divine wisdom, his exquisite morality, and his prophecies. Let's take a look at, uh, is, is there evidence for that Jesus is divine? Jesus proclaims that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, which, is, which it isn't. Jesus mistakes names of, of, of characters in the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus cannot make up his mind whether or not the Mosaic law is still important and immutable. Jesus reputably recommends to sell or renounce all your possessions. He recommends to not gather your riches, not to care about food or clothing, and generally not to worry about tomorrow. According to Jesus, oh, by the way, this, this, is, this is where it gets really serious. He repeatedly, falsely assures people about the power of faith and of the effectiveness of prayer, of prayer about anything. He warns, you, he warns you against loving your life. He recommends hating yourself, hating you, hating your life, and he recommends losing your life. According to Jesus, it is appropriate that a servant is punished by beating if he did not know what the will of the master was. Uh, according to Jesus, it is necessary to hate your family in order to be right with God, and it's appropriate to leave your parents, leave your wife, and leave your, leave your children in order to join him as a wandering preacher. And of course, Jesus failed in the prophecies which is not surprising because the whole of the Bible fails in its prophecies. Jesus prophesied that not one stone upon the other would stand from the complex of the Jerusalem temple. And we know that in Jerusalem right now today stands a big wall, the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall, which is part of the Jerusalem temple complex. Um, Jesus could not even prophesy properly his own death and resurrection. He invoked the, uh, the, the story about uh, the prophet Jonas, who was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. And so he prophesied that he, wa he will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, however you count, now granted the resurrection is true, however you count, 
how long he was in the grave, it's not three days and three nights. And most embarrassingly of all, the coming of the Son of Man, the second coming of the Son of Man, the end of the world, the final judgment, was supposed to happen during the lifetime of his disciples that were standing there and that were listening to him. So what does the evidence really point to? Um, there is no evidence that the Bible and Jesus of Nazareth are divine or even exceptional in inspiration or in person. So evidence I presented further indicates to the contrary. The Bible looks exactly as we would expect it if, if they were, this was a collection of ordinary religious books reflecting scientific knowledge, cultural norms, and morality of, a, of the particular people, place, and time of their origin. Nothing about it proves, indicates, that it is a special revelation from God. Therefore, unless, unless Professor Taylor provides evidence for the supernatural origin and content of the Bible, he cannot legitimately say that whatever the Bible says constitutes evidence that Christianity is true. To sum up, evidence is observable phenomena that reliably and unambiguously points to the truth of a particular hypothesis. Observable phenomena that are purported to, uh, to attest the truth of Christianity are either unreliable or ambiguous, and in the case of the Bible, even contrary. Therefore, I think and I propose to you tonight that Christianity is not evidence-based, and furthermore, to say it is a huge misrepresentation of the issue. Thank you very much.